Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, I'm gonna be talking about some compact uh, evergreen plants, little low growing plants that will work great on a foundation, uh, just plants that you can kind of put in the ground and not really uh, have to think about a whole lot once you get them established. And I'm gonna jump right in and talk about this Dragon Prince uh, Cryptomeria. This one is similar to one called Globosa nana. Uh, both of these are good choices for a low growing conifer. Uh, they're both uh, soft to the touch. Uh, Cryptomeria is just a Japanese cedar. They're Japanese cedars that get 50, 80 feet tall, uh, and then ones that are kind of in between that. And then you got these little true dwarfs, and there's a lot of them, but I'm really drawn to Dragon Prince and Globosa Nana. They're perfect little round domes that you don't really have to do anything to. Uh, if they're, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll slowly but surely reach that four or five foot range over a long period of time, but they can be controlled down in the two, two and a half foot range, slightly wider than tall. So this is Radiant Abelia. This is one of the most compact, low growing, low maintenance Abelia uh, on the market. I, actually, it's probably my, my number one. Uh, Miss Lemon would be my number two. And the main thing is these hold their color really, really well through the winter. So what you're seeing here in this, this kind of yellow, yellowish variegation, uh, this will remain like this throughout the winter. It has this red stem underneath it too, which is also interesting. These bloom literally all summer once they get started. They'll they get started blooming a little later than, you know, after your spring flowering shrubs typically. So toward the beginning of June, and then they'll literally bloom until you get a frost in the fall. Pollinators absolutely love them. Again, they look like this year round. One of my all time favorite low growing evergreen shrubs are Indian hawthorns. But we've seen over the last two decades or so, a lot of leaf spot disease issues in a lot of our low growing compact Indian hawthorns. But this variety right here is called Clean Sweep Snowbank. Uh, it's a white flowering dwarf that has no, none of the, uh, it's resistant to the leaf spot. And so there's no spotting whatsoever on this one. You can see this, this one's been in the ground for about a year. I've got some perennial, uh, some annuals crowding it and a couple things crowding it that need to be cut back. But look how great of a little low doming plant this is. It blooms white. Uh, in the spring and then it just becomes this little low doming plant with perfect dark green shiny foliage and you know the new growth on it has a slightly lighter color so it's you know has a bit of that two-tone in it but just a great uh, indestructible kind of low doming evergreen plant of course you can't have a video about compact evergreen shrubs without talking about boxwoods and there's lots of different varieties of boxwoods just you know make sure the one you're picking if you're going for a low growing one you know, fits that category because there are boxwoods that are upright and fastigiate. You know, see how this one's kind of going upright and then there are ones that are more doming shaped. Typically you can tell in the container how it's going to grow in the landscape. But of course, you know, boxwoods can be kept any size or any size you want to keep them from, you know, a foot and a half tall to, you know, five feet in height. So one of the best, most industrial, compact, low growing plants is Carissa holly. It does have one problem, uh, uh, that over time, it can revert back to the old variety, which was called rotundifolium, which had more points on the leaf. The normal leaf on Carissa holly has just a single point on the end. I had these on my foundation for 23 years at the old house. At around 15 years, that rotundifolium started to show back up and it. it was reverting back to what it originally was, because Carissa holly is just a sport of rotundifolium. Other than that, I mean, other than the fact that I know after about 15 or 20 years, I'm probably gonna have to pull this plant out. This is a plant it and forget it kind of plant. Just a perfect low, you can keep it two feet tall and three feet wide. It can creep up to four feet. I've seen these in, in where they've never been pruned, that they creeped up to five feet, but that was over a 20 year period of time in the middle of a road somewhere. Easy plant to keep in that perfect little ball shape super super drought tolerant down here's another one uh, there'll be several abelia in this video some green and uh, some variegated but this is rose creek abelia uh, what makes rose creek interesting is number one it's a dwarf so it stays small and compact it's just as drought tolerant and disease resistant and all those kinds of things as any other abelia gets the flowers on it that the bees are attracted to all summer and then where the flowers were on rose creek the um, calyx becomes reddish over time and it actually looks like it's a second round of flowering on this plant these have been pruned a few times they haven't been allowed to flower during the uh, season they're trying to make them perfect for uh for retail sale but the ones that are blooming here 
it looks like you have a white flower that's in the middle of some red flowers, but that's just where the calyx is behind where the flower falls out. So interesting plant uh, for really year round interest and super compact habit. So we saw Radiance and Miss Lemon Abelia. Those are two variegated ones uh, at the house that say small. Third variegated one here is Kaleidoscope. And Kaleidoscope, again, when I'm, we're talking about Abelia and these dwarf Abelia or regular Abelia, they're drought tolerant, low maintenance, easy plants. Uh, they'll take dry shade, uh, although you know they'll go into full, absolute full sun as well. Kaleidoscope turns an orangey kind of color in the winter time that I'm not particularly drawn to, but this is one of the best selling plants in the nursery trade, hands down, period. I like Miss, I prefer Miss Lemon or Radiance just because they hold their color a bit more, a bit better during the winter time. Beside me here is one of the, you know, one of the biggest selling plants I had when I was in the uh, nursery business. This is Frostproof Gardenia. Frostproof Gardenia is a super compact uh, dome shaped uh, gardenia that maybe you can keep between three and four feet in height and three and four feet in width easily heavily blooming it has a double flower which a lot of people are you know more drawn to on gardenias although some of the single flowering ones actually flower more uh, but again this one has the more traditional uh, double flower dark green compact habit really easy plant and again you can after this thing blooms in the spring you can cut it down and keep it two and a half feet by two and a half feet or three feet by three feet, four feet by whatever. It's just a perfect little round dome. Here's a compact plant for the shade. This is soft caress Mahonia, great little fine textured evergreen shrub. Gets uh, yellow flowers in the winter time that the uh, pollinators are attracted to. Just a great little low compact plant. And I find, uh, you know, this plant matches almost everything because it's got, it's got that contrasting foliage, slightly different coloration and again it blooms in the winter time how can you mess with that this one could almost be considered a ground cover uh, this prostrate cephalotaxis shows up in so many shade uh, gardens that we cover on this channel uh, it's just a great great plant it can be kept whatever width you want to keep it it'll get it'll get wider in time and again it's almost a ground cover but it can be kept as just a low little ornamental shrub that's almost no maintenance really other than occasionally you know, reining it, the, the width back in, which it grows so slowly that, you know, that will only be a once a year project. So this one is probably my favorite of the plants that are going to be uh, in this video. And they just look great back here in this part shade condition. This is Mojo Pittosporum. There are variegated Pittosporum that can get, I've seen as high as 20, 25 feet and the green uh, Pittosporum, same thing. Uh, but then there are these little dwarfs. This one's called Mojo, and it's a variegated version, as you can see. Uh, just contrasts beautifully with almost anything. Perfect in this little light shade condition. It brightens up a kind of a darker spot under some other things uh, back here in the landscape. And then I've got a green version of this called Wheeler's Dwarf. And uh, both of them, you can see in the growth habit, are definitely much wider than tall. These haven't been pruned at all since they went in the ground. They've been in the ground maybe you know, 18 to 24 months at this point. And they're just easy, low maintenance plants. I talked about the soft caress Mahonia back at uh, Pender Nursery, uh, right here in the middle of the video. And you can see this is one that's been in the ground for 18 months or so. And you can see the height and the basic shape of it. And it's just great um, narrow foliage, which just contrasts well with almost anything you put it with, again, in part shade conditions to shade conditions. One thing to take from this video is that a lot of the plants I'm showing you have, these are dwarfs of, of other plants. And so you could definitely buy the wrong one. Like, you, like I told you on the Pittosporum can get you know, 25 feet tall unless you buy the dwarf Pittosporum. It's the same thing with this Viburnum obovatum. This is Ralston's Hardy Viburnum. I have a video for this uh, on the channel. This one's a low compact one that can be kept just like what you're looking at now where it's two feet tall and three or four feet wide or it can be uh, you know, allowed to creep up a bit bigger than that. This one will bloom heavily and blooms often. It's one of the longest blooming evergreen shrubs, but the, the regular native Viburnum obovatum is a, a small tree almost. So it's uh, Ralston's Hardy uh, is a great compact version. Another one of those plants that has uh, gotten smaller and smaller and smaller in my time in this business is definitely Laura Petalum. Uh, old varieties of Laura Petalum will just uh, if you don't plant them in the right place, they will just drive you nuts. I mean, they're, they were really screening plants that people decided to put on foundations and they have to prune a lot. They've been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And currently I think Purple Daydream right here is the best of the dwarf uh, Laura Petalum. 
I've seen these more, this one's been in the ground probably two years at this point or coming up on two years if it hasn't been two years. I saw, we saw some recently that had been in the ground for about three and they're just perfect little three foot tall purple, uh, purple foliage. I've got this one where the shade is hitting it from a little earlier and so it's losing a bit of the color but it still looks great in what I would call part shade. If it was in the full sun, it would be solid purple all the way through. But I think Purple Daydream right now is the best. And then I've got one called Emerald Snow, which is a green foliage variety with white flowers. Also ultra compact and super, super easy to keep anywhere between two and a half feet in height and maybe four feet in height. With a few more to mention in this video, let me know down below what's your kind of go-to evergreen, low maintenance plant, you know, that somebody can keep below, you know, on a low foundation or below windows, you know, what's your kind of go-to? Obviously, I can't cover them all in a video. These are ones I have in, in my garden and ones that happen to be uh, looking good over at Pender Nursery the other day. I definitely have to mention uh, Nandinas, the dwarf Nandinas specifically. Uh, we have firepower, which turns bright red in the wintertime, so this is what it's going to look like during the uh, summer. This actually is a variegated version of it. Uh, that we have here the new growth earlier in the season is all variegated like this or it actually comes out this color then it goes it becomes variegated like that also turns red uh, in the winter time two others that i would definitely mention for great compact plants are obsession and also lemon lime obsession has really great red new growth on it throughout the season and then uh, lemon lime is what it sounds like it's kind of a chartreuse color all four of the ones that i just mentioned are seed free and so they're not invasive like many of the other um, older varieties of nandinas the only holly i've mentioned in this video so far is carissa carissa has is a broadleaf holly it's a chinese holly that's you know has the broader foliage and does have the point on the end of the uh, leaf and that one you know carissa stays as that perfect little round ball then there's the japanese hollies of which there are a lot of dwarf ones uh hugendorn is one and this one is called touch of gold and this is a gold version of Hugendorn holly, but I really have always been drawn to Hugendorn, grew a lot of them, sold a lot of them at my nursery. What tends to be more in the trade uh, that you'll see is soft touch and hellerai. And uh, I've always considered both of those a little bit wimpy in the landscape. You have to be careful uh, not to, uh, if you go long periods of time without water or rain, to make sure that your soft touch don't dry out. I mean, I've seen a lot of dead soft touch hollies. And they sell like crazy because they're perfect little round balls in the containers, but I do think Hugendorn overall is a hardier plant. So you can get the regular green Hugendorn or the uh, this is the gold version of it. And then I have to mention another native that, uh, you know, yeah, uh, make sure you get the dwarf Yopon holly, but dwarf Yopon is one of the probably kings of low compact plants. It can creep up and let me just say that almost everything I've shown you in this video, the tags are gonna say two to three feet in height maybe three to four feet in height, but none of these plants have some sort of magic off switch. So if you let them grow over a long period of time and never prune them, they're going to go through the specs that are on the tag. Consider the tag more maintainable at, and uh, it's much easier to think of it that way. Uh, you can keep it between two and three feet in height. Dwarf Yopon hollies I've seen as tall as six feet uh, if they're 20 or 30 years old and they've never been pruned, but it's a really easy one to keep very, very small. And then again, there's the regular native Yopons that are basically small, almost small trees uh, if allowed to grow that way. But Dwarf Yopons probably at the top of the list of most industrial, uh, pretty much deer proof and uh, most drought tolerant of the low growing evergreen hollies. My friends at Pender Nursery have let me uh, film out here for these uh, these videos, these collections of, of videos. And I found a, uh, a, a crop, a young crop of Goshiki Osmanthus. This is a really great uh, slow growing evergreen shrub um, or ever whatever color you want to call this. This, uh, this variegation is amazing. Uh, Goshiki means five colors in Japanese and so as you see new growth on this plant uh, during the season you get these pinks and reds and, um, and then it settles into this like creamy white and green variegation. Just a beautiful beautiful plant shooting this going into fall and it'll look like this even in the winter time. Oh, this one's a little slow to flower. Um, Osmanthus have great fragrant flowers. It takes sometimes years for this one to, uh, to flower. Once it does, uh, it'll flower during the uh, cool season months. 
you're going to see this plant labeled anywhere from you know getting three feet in height to 10 feet in height uh, and that's accurate <laughs> is this plant is slow growing and can kind of be kept any size you want between you know three and ten feet uh, there's one at the ralston where they've never pruned it uh, the ralston arboretum in raleigh and it's probably seven or eight feet has a little pyramid without doing any pruning on it uh, whatsoever but again it could be kept in that three to four foot range on your foundation just a great plant come to the ground cover juniper section and i think uh pretty much everything over here will end up in a ground cover video but they do have some gray owl junipers uh, and this one is this amazing blue green color uh, year round and i would put this one almost in the small shrub category uh, it will spread more than it will come upright but it ends up you know when i see it in the landscape in that three to four foot uh, range and does that on its own really don't have to do anything to this plant other than you'll probably have to bring it in a bit you know because it will try to get wider wider than tall but this is really great um super drought tolerant and honestly underused plant for this this beautiful coloration it's going to be great color contrast it's going to be great texture contrast uh, with the other things that you're using in your landscape but again we could argue whether this one's a ground cover or a low shrub i'm going to go with low shrub in the first compact plant video i showed one called dragon prince uh, i have two of them at the uh, at the home garden one in the ground and it's maybe a foot and a half tall and two feet wide at this point. And then there's one in a container as well. And I talked about Globosa nana, but we didn't show it. Globosa nana is a bit more fluffy. That's how I would describe it. Dragon Prince is a little more, it has a little more of a compact habit. Uh, I could put this one in the compact plant um, or low growing category, which is what you're going to see it in this video. I could also put this in the uh, medium plant category as well. It's easily maintainable around three feet, so you can keep it as a perfect little low dome. If you never, ever, ever prune it, um, it'll eventually just creep up to about five feet. Again, nothing's gonna, there's no off switch for these plants. But one of the great things about this particular conifer, I think it's extremely heat tolerant compared to some others that we'll show you in some of these other videos. Um, so for those of us in the South, it makes a great, great option. And it's also soft to the touch, which a lot of these conifers are you know, um, they, they bite back when you touch them. There were three low growing hollies that I discussed in the first video, but did not show. Uh, there was uh, Hugendorn right here, a uh, touch of gold holly, the gold one that I showed in the first video is a gold version of this. Hugendorn is a great low growing holly. I think it's, uh, uh, this one's just kind of, I, I don't know why it's never been the top seller, honestly, of all of the 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 japanese low growing hollies the one on the right over here is called soft touch it probably is the best selling one and it's probably the wimpiest plant even yesterday steph and i were riding through the neighborhood and somebody had planted like 20 of these in their front garden and 10 of them were were dead we just see it all the time uh, with this particular variety that soft touch the native one uh low growing option is our dwarf yopon holly which is just a you know this is how it grows perfect little dome like this. The regular Yopon holly will be in the screening plant video. There's a weeping Yopon holly and then there's a dwarf Yopon holly. Again, like I've said several times now, if you don't prune this plant ever, it will get quite big. We, there's one in the neighborhood that's over six feet in height. I'd never seen a dwarf Yopon holly that tall, but there is one in the neighborhood that's over six feet. It's probably 25 years old, maybe more, but it easily can be kept in the three foot range. But if you want a native option, dwarf Yopon, uh, as far as, as I'm going to rank the Japanese hollies, I think Hugendorn uh, is the best, or that touch of gold, the gold one that was in the first video. Here's one more Japanese holly for the, uh, you know, the compact plant group. Uh, this is Hellerai, been around for a long, long time. Uh, again, this one also I've seen creep up four or five feet in height and as much as eight feet in width if it's not uh, ever pruned, but really, really easy to keep this one in the two to three foot range and three to four feet in width. I do think, again, I think Hugendorn's a better better overall uh, plant than Hellerai, but Hellerai's also better than Soft Touch and just in being, this one, Soft Touch just kind of took this one's place. This was always the kind of go-to compact, you know, Japanese holly, boxwood looking plant that wasn't as, as expensive as boxwoods because boxwoods grow slower in nurseries, so they tend to be a little more expensive. So this is like your, your boxwood replacement uh, plant and soft touch is just kind of taking that over and I don't think it's, it's just it's not a great ornamental plant uh, not a great landscape plant but this is Hellerai. this is a, a new crop of touch of gold holly which I showed in the first video this is a golden Hellerai. so I wanted to show you that uh, this is the gold version of Hugendorn there's also a gold Hellerai. there's a gold soft touch there's a gold version 
of all of them. It's not the gold is not quite as pronounced uh, on Hellerai, and it doesn't hold up in the sun quite as well. But if you have a kind of a park shade uh, uh, spot, it needs some light to get the gold tips, you know, to get the gold new growth on it. Um, but tends to, like I say, it cooks a little bit in the absolute full sun. But it's a great, it's a great little plant. It is. But I think that as you can see, side by side, you know, touch of gold is definitely, you know, a bigger pop of color. Another great medium size shrub that I've got some experience with is this Nightlight Camia Cifrus. This is a Southern Living Plant Collection piece. This one uh, on the tag says four to five feet by four to five feet, and that's what it looks like it will be doing uh, over the next uh, few years. Right now, it's it's been in the ground for about right at two years, probably at this point, maybe not quite, and it's reached uh, you know two and a half by two and a half. It has never been touched uh, by any pruning shears. It just grows in this perfect round ball. Very, very heat tolerant for a Camiociferus or a false cypress. Uh, super impressed with this plant. It's, you know, I'm shooting this in September. It's got a tiny bit of bleaching on the top that we would see, you would see on a lot of gold conifers by late summer, but it's only a tiny bit and it's been in the full sun all summer here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Here's a fantastic, very compact growing distillium called Cast in Bronze. Uh, it has, we're here again, um, shooting this in September, and so it doesn't have a lot of new growth on it right now, but the new growth on it has this amazing bronze coloration, stays super compact. You can tell by the growth habit of this one that it's more spreading than upright. Uh, on the tag, I think it says three to four feet by three to four feet. I think it's can be easy to keep this one even shorter than three to four feet, more like three feet, and, and think about it as four feet wide. But I can, a lot of times once I put something in the ground, I can immediately tell by the growth habit whether or not it's kind of been, you know, accurately tagged because if all the growth is going vertical on it, which a lot of distillium, you'll see, even in the container, you're gonna see that vertical growth. That's one that's gonna end up head high or taller. Cast in bronze has this great spreading habit. So I can't say this about a lot of camellias, uh, camellia sasanquas or japonicas. I can't put them in the compact uh, plant video, but I can on this white shishi. Uh, this is October Magic white shishi from the Southern Living Plant Collection. You can see the growth habit on it where the limbs come up and then start to fold down. Uh, this one can be kept under four feet easily. Uh, it hasn't stretched at all. Um, it's in a part shade condition where you um, perfect space for a camellia sasanqua. Uh, budded up like crazy uh, and uh, in the process of swelling those buds right now as the nighttime temperatures drop that's when the camellia sasanquas will bloom in the fall so I expect that around mid-October through about Christmas really to have these beautiful white double flowers on a very compact growing camellia. Here's a group of Climbs Hardy gardenias. Uh, this one this is a great compact growing uh, gardenia perfect for a foundation perfect for you know, any, any place you need a little three to four foot round ball, because that's how this one grows. It blooms heavily in the spring. And then this one has always had, you know, the ability to continue to, you know, throw on some, so throw on some more flowers the rest of the season. So despite the fact that the flowers are single, it makes up for it in the number of flowers you're going to have over the course of the year. Of course, they're extremely fragrant. I could also put this plant into the mid, into a video of kind of mid-sized shrubs because I've seen this one as tall as head high in the landscape. So, you know, keep that in mind. I'm, you know, this is maintainable between three and four feet, but if, you know, if you've got a spot where you can use something that's five or six feet, this will also work. The one of the most compact plants you'll see in this video, uh, this is Gardenia radicans. Uh, this is basically a ground cover uh, gardenia. It can creep up to, I've seen these as tall as three feet or so. Uh, gets as wide as you want to let it get, but not in a hurry so you can you know, come back and, and prune it uh, whenever you need to prune it. These bloom heavily with double white flowers uh, in the spring. So they're gonna bloom uh, typically a little later than other spring flowering shrubs. So more like May into early June. And then as you see here, shooting this in September, it's absolutely loaded with flower buds. So it'll bloom on temperature change as the nighttime temperature started to change a bit here going into um, late summer, early fall. Uh, it's kind of reset it and some new flowers are coming. I will tell you these uh, do not like wet feet. And so when I plant gardenia radicans, I'm kind of careful to mound them up a bit, make sure I'm not putting them in a wet area. There's a variegated version of this as well that's even more compact and really, really grows very close to the ground. But gardenia radicans is super popular. This one is a really sun or shade. I see this one doing uh, well in both conditions, again, as long as they're not in wet spaces. 
Here's a beautiful group of Duke Gardens Plum U. Uh, this is really a great, super compact growing evergreen shrub. It can actually end up growing four to six feet in height, four to six feet in width eventually, but this one is super easy to keep in that three foot tall range, maybe a little wider than tall. Uh, it has a little bit of a cascading habit. As you can see, these are small. This is a new crop, so they're not, they don't have a lot of size on them, but you can see as they come up, each branch weeps down. And uh, so you, you can get after these hard. This is a, this is one of those great part shade uh, plants. It's probably honestly underused, uh, undervalued in the landscape, extremely drought tolerant. All of these, um, cephalotaxis or false use, uh, we see them frequently uh, competing well against very established trees in the landscape. And that's from you know the ground cover ones to the mid-size ones, even the fastidiate ones um, are really, uh, can get out there and compete with existing trees uh, in the landscape. We found a new crop of inkberry hollies. Uh, this variety is called shamrock. Uh, shamrock was picked years ago because it has it stays fuller down to the base. Uh, uh, inkberry hollies are a native holly, and they tend to be in the landscape kind of thin uh, down at the bottom. So shamrock was again picked to stay fuller like this. Uh, th this is a female uh, selection. If you have a male inkberry holly near it, they'll have these uh, really great black berries through the entire winter. The new growth on it is a lighter color. Uh, than the older growth and so it has kind of a really nice two-tone uh, uh, look to it during the growing season. I'm shooting this in September so they pretty much stopped putting on new growth uh, at this point. Being a native uh, holly this thing is really tolerant of a lot of different conditions and so if you have you know wetter conditions uh, don't put it down in just water uh, but you mount, mound it up uh, in an area that doesn't drain as well this is probably a pretty good choice for that kind of space or in the driest you know, conditions in your yard. They're also pretty shade tolerant, although they will get a little bit thinner. You have to do a little bit of shearing on them uh, to keep them fuller, but sun or shade. Here's another compact growing Mahonia variety. This one's called Nirahara. I have a hard time saying, hard time saying that word. It's a great uh, soft textured plant, uh, narrow leaf. It'll contrast nicely with almost anything else you're growing in your shade garden. Uh, these will start flowering in the fall and flower on and off throughout the winter, just depending on how warm it is. Uh, pollinators are attracted to the, uh, to the flowers. So it's blooming at a, it, you know, at a time of year when other things aren't blooming. So on warmer days, you know, when those flowers open up, bees will take that opportunity to uh, get on them. Uh, soft caress is probably slightly more compact uh, than this one, but both of them are quite compact and both of them offer this, you know, great, you know, again, soft texture, kind of a blue green foliage, new growth on it. It's kind of a lighter green. So, uh, you know, it even has, you know, color contrast on itself as well. So really, uh, really a great plant. Uh, and, and it will grow in pretty much any part shade to shade condition. This is a great, almost industrial compact growing plant. This is lemon lime nandina. Uh, gets uh, all the new growth on this plant is bright gold and holds that you know through most you know through the winter as well. These are in a lot of shade here, so they're not quite as bright as when I see them out in the landscape. This one will take full sun or part shade. Uh, it's deer resistant, rabbit resistant, uh, urine resistant, or salt tolerant. It's a great salt tolerant plant, so a co good coastal plant. This one does not. Uh, this one does not flower, so therefore it doesn't fruit, so it's not invasive like other Nandinas, but again, it has all those qualities of being drought tolerant and really a rugged landscape plant and then a bright pop of gold uh, in the garden. Here's a Pieris called Temple Bells. Uh, this is a white flowering one. Uh, these are one of the big kickoffs to spring. It's one of the earliest flowering woody ornamental shrubs. It's uh, a great evergreen plant. And when it, it had, you know, these, almost like tassel-like clusters of flowers open up in the uh, late winter, uh, early spring, and they're lightly fragrant. Uh, it just gets absolutely covered in these bell-shaped flowers. And then uh, after the flowering is finished, all the new growth that comes out on it has this maroon coloration. Again, shooting this in September, so it doesn't have any of that color uh, to show you right now, but this plant uh, even after it finishes flowering, that spring flush is almost just as beautiful uh, as the flowering. Really easy shade evergreen plant. Um, 
pretty drought tolerant once it's established, but initially it needs some extra water. Somewhat um, uh, susceptible to root rot, so make sure you mound it up a bit when you plant it. Some of our shady spaces can stay a little wetter sometimes than we think, but really an easy, easy plant to get some uh, color really before almost anything else will be blooming in your shady space. Here's a great compact growing gardenia. This is a variegated radicans. Radicans is kind of known as almost like a ground cover gardenia that can end up three feet tall and you know three or four feet wide. Uh, the variegated one stays even lower than that. I've rarely seen this plant above about 18 inches in height. It could almost be argued as a ground cover uh, more than a, than a, than a low growing shrub. Uh, it doesn't bloom quite as much as the regular radicans, but it does have the double white flowers that are, that are very fragrant. It's really more grown for this really great bright variegation. This plant will take almost sun or shade really. I wouldn't put it in absolute full sun, but uh, you know, slightly less than a full day sun down to shaded spaces. Uh, a couple things on this plant. It will try to revert back to green at some point. And so if you see a green limb coming out on it, get it cut out quick and follow it. Follow the green piece all the way back down into the middle of the plant and cut it out there. Otherwise that green one will grow much faster than the variegated one and it will quickly become a green plant uh, in time. You don't have to do that very often, but maybe once a year if you see, you know, you're walking past it, you see any green in it, cut it out. Doesn't take but a second. Uh, and also it doesn't like wet feet. And so when you plant these, make sure you're mounding them up a bit, not putting them in an area that you know is going to stay wet. Also works great as a container plant. Although in zone seven, it had to be protected in the winter time if it was in a container, but zone eight, nine, uh, even 10, great uh, container plant through the winter. All right, standing in a beautiful crop of auto lucan laurels. Uh, this is a great, super compact growing evergreen shrub with beautiful glossy dark green foliage uh, for part shade or shade conditions. Uh, this one, I, you know, I can put in a video of compact plants because it can easily be kept only three feet in height, maybe five or six feet in width, or it can go up to five or six feet uh, if you let them. They'll uh, spring flower with white flowers um, once, they're, once, once they get their footing under them, which are very, very showy. And then, you know, they just look like this the rest of the year with this incredible, you know, shi shiny foliage on them and uh, incredibly low maintenance. These are susceptible to root rot. And so when you plant them, you want to uh, mound them up just a bit and uh, make sure you're not over watering them. Uh, do check on the watering. Like, any, you know, I, 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 I say that sometimes and I'm worried that people won't check on the watering at all. If you plant it properly, mound it up a bit, then you should be able to do normal watering on it and not worry about it staying too wet. I'm gonna finish up this compact plant video uh, with Chef's Choice Rosemary. Uh, again, I'll link down below the first compact plant video. I think this will make something like over 40 uh, plants between the uh, two videos, and we're going to continue to add to it uh, as we go. This Chef's Choice Rosemary is a fantastic compact grower. Uh, this one's been in the ground for a little over two years. It's probably a little uh, hair shy of three feet. This is about as tall as it will get. It'll try to get wider in time. It can be pruned from the top. It can be pruned from the sides to rein it in some. These are extremely drought tolerant. They have beautiful texture, you know, narrow leaves with a blue green color. They're deer resistant, drought tolerant, heat tolerant, uh, all kinds of, 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 of amazing qualities for rosemary in the landscape. There are prostrate growing varieties, meaning flat to the ground. There are taller growing varieties than chef's choice. This one was picked um, for its culinary qualities to be a dwarf and to have a culinary quality. They also bloom, believe it or not. A lot of people may not know that they are, uh, have really interesting blue flowers, typically in the cooler season. I'm shooting this in September and this one happens to have a few flowers, but typically it's more, more likely in, in cooler temperatures and early winter and late winter. Uh, but Chef's Choice Rosemary, just is, this is just a fantastic plant. And again, it's been here for two years and nothing's been done to it with Gumpo Azaleas. Gumpo Azaleas have been around for a long time. These are traditional, traditional Azaleas and they happen to have a dwarf low mounding habit. You think this thing's probably been pruned on a lot, but it really hasn't. Uh, this is a pink Gumpo. Gumpo Azaleas are available in pinks and whites. Uh, there's another uh, dwarf variety called Chinsoy that I used to grow as well. It's a little bit deeper of a pink than this, but also has an extremely compact habit. When we're talking about in the, uh, 
the sun version of this very low growing two foot evergreen plants version I talked about Encore azaleas. They definitely need a little bit more sun, but these traditional azaleas like to be in the part shade or shade. And as Steph just pointed out before we started shooting this, these are a great substitute for one of those low growing hedging plants that you would have uh, out in the full sun, something like dwarf yopon hollies, which actually can take some shade, uh, and some other of our low growing Japanese hollies and that kind of thing. It has that look. So even this white gumpo is not blooming right now, but look what a full dense habit it has. And again, really don't ever have to prune on these. If you do need to prune on them, you prune on them right after they flower. That's really important with these traditional azaleas. Don't do any hacking on them except for once a year, right after they bloom. You can cut them down to about, if you want to keep them two feet in height, you cut them down to about 18 inches. They'll grow back out three, four, five inches over the, the rest of the season, set their flower buds in the fall, and then bloom beautifully in the early spring. Uh, this sarcococa is sarcococa confusa. This one does not stay as compact as Sarcococa humilis. This one can be kept into that two to three foot range, but it's going to want to try to get bigger. And you can probably see that behind me a bit where it wants to stretch out a bit more. So if you can find Sarcococa humilis, that's the one you would want. That's the dwarf sweet box. But these are great evergreen shrubs. They're going to get fragrant flowers that are kind of insignificant along the stems. I can actually see where the berries have set, where the flowers were. Uh, from the late winter time. It's one of the earliest flowering shrubs that we have. We have a little cluster, a cluster of three of these at the house. Great, rich, dark, shiny foliage, great element in a shady space. If you put something like that uh, variegated, like that variegated gardenia next to this, where it's you know slightly smaller and has that pop of color, this dark green foliage behind it, they'd look fantastic together. I started the idea for this video is uh, 10 shrubs that you could keep around two feet in height uh, in part shade or shade conditions. And now I'm standing next to a plant that never becomes a woody shrub. Uh, this is cast iron plant or Aspidistra. There are a lot, a lot of cultivars of these. Uh, we have uh, several at the house. You'll see this is the solid green version. And a lot of times when you go to stores, you're going to see the solid green version for the most part. But there are incredible ones. We have one called Asahi. It has white tips up at the very top. We have striped ones. We have spotted ones. There are lots and lots of named cultivars of cast iron plants. These stay evergreen through the winter. If they take any damage, uh, you can just take leaves that were damaged during the winter and cut those down to the ground and they very quickly get replaced uh, during the spring. Uh, you can generally cut them back if you wanted to, but there's really no reason for it. You can just leave the leaves up from last year. Once they get about two years old, though, they do get a little tattered and you can cut them back. But I think this is a great vertical element in a part shade bed that will only get up to that two, maybe two and a half foot range and then perfectly fine. It's also incredibly drought tolerant. So if you have a space that's slightly under an overhang, maybe doesn't get quite as much water uh, as some other spaces in your yard or in your shade garden, these are perfect for that. Here's another non-shrub evergreen that I'd like to point out. This is a holly fern. Uh, I'm sticking these two right in the middle of this video just because I wanted to show you a couple other options. You don't necessarily have to have a you know woody shrub to do this. Uh, these holly ferns look fantastic uh, pretty much year round. One of my favorite foliage plants we see. Again, this one's not going to take the dry shade uh, like the Aspidistra. So you would use you know the, the cast iron plant over there in really, really dry shade, deep shade conditions. And you could use this in slightly more moist conditions. If you had a patio or something that tend to retain some moisture around it, that kind of thing, perfect plant for that. One other one that you can definitely use in the shade is boxwoods. And in fact, boxwoods are native to woodlands. Uh, we, we think about boxwoods frequently being planted out by uh, road signs at the front of subdivisions and things like that. But any of the uh, Almost all the boxwood species will tolerate lots and lots of shade. Uh, and of course they can be kept pretty much any size you wanna keep them. I would aim toward one that's only listed for two or three feet you know, in height. If you're looking for a variety, don't get one that you know, says on the tag that it gets eight feet tall and upright and narrow and try to keep that two feet because it's gonna look a little strange. But most of the lower growing mounding or doming boxwoods work perfectly fine in part shade conditions and they'll actually tolerate dry shade uh, and it's again it's one of those things for some somehow in ornamental landscaping i see them almost exclusively planted in the full sun but when we go to really nice old established gardens the boxwoods are doing fantastic in the shade i'm going to wrap this up with this burning love lakothui 
Uh, be careful, I'm not saying all Lakothawi, you can keep two feet in height. In fact, uh, when we're uh, our native Lakothawi to the Southeast United States, I've seen as tall as 15 and 18 feet in height and have trunks on them this big around. They're almost small trees uh, out, out in the wild. This is actually a Japanese uh, species right here and it has beautiful new uh, burgundy foliage on it for a good portion of the season. Blooms with these white uh, flowers that hang down similar to how uh, blueberries flower. Quite showy when it flowered, quite showy when it's anytime it's actively growing. This one's been in the ground over two years and it's right at about two feet in height. I can prune it at this point if I want to try to keep it a little smaller, but its growth habit is to send this up like it's going to be tall and then just kind of weep over like these are doing out on the side of it. So I'm probably going to more likely control the width uh, than the height. Well, we have one other variegated Lakothwi in the back garden that also can be kept very compact as well, but I love these. I love the texture of the leaf on these, similar to that soft caress Mahonia. Uh, again, this is another one that probably wants to be uh, moist, well-drained soil, not a, not a super, super wet space uh, for this burning love of Lakothwi. Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, I'm going to be covering the 14 dwarf Encore Zellia varieties. I'm down here at Flowerwood Nursery in South Alabama. This is one of the only places where I could probably find all 14 that are considered dwarfs. These are varieties that can be kept you know, three feet or less. They probably end up slightly wider than that, but it got all different colors. We got pinks, reds, whites, and purples uh, in this mix of Encore Azaleas. And like I say, these are all the ones that, you know, you can keep small. These are, of course, evergreen shrubs that bloom in the spring. Uh, typically will bloom, bloom some in the, in the summer as well. And then again, in the fall, uh, very heavily. Uh, I'm down here in October. And of the 14, I found, uh, maybe half uh, have at least one flower on them. They're in some stage of flowering, just finishing or just starting. Uh, that's the thing about having multiple varieties is that you can end up with flowers almost all the time. Uh, I had Buddy Lee, uh, I interviewed him uh, yesterday, the inventor of Encore Azaleas, and we were talking about, uh, you know, he used different uh, types of azaleas to create these uh, Encore Azaleas. They weren't just all from the same Azalea, that's how you end up with ones that will only get two and a half feet tall and ones that will get four and five feet tall. We're concentrating in this video on the ones that you can keep super low. So I'm going to walk through them real quick. Like I say, they're not showing a lot of color, but I'll put up some flower photos uh, during this uh, video and I'll put up the uh, uh, how, how big they'll get and what zones they'll grow in. Some of them will grow up to zone six and some of them uh, seven is kind of the, uh, kind of the cap on uh, low temperatures. Uh, here we go. So I'll move through these real quickly. This is autumn lilac. This is a purple. I have uh, planted five of those in a uh, video not that long ago and talked about how to plant them. If you're interested in knowing how to plant them, just look in my Encore collection of videos. There are, uh, uh, I, I've planted several in my yard um, over time and uh, you can take a look at how I went about that. This is autumn cheer, which is a nice pink. Uh, that variety tends to be a little more upright, but it does ultimately stay uh, pretty small. If you have a narrow spot, uh, autumn cheer is a good choice. Uh, autumn coral is really nice with that coral pink uh, flower. I've always really liked starlight. This is starlight right here. Starlight has some pink um, highlights in the uh, white flowers. Uh, nice variety, um, kind of a spreading variety. Autumn ruby uh, is nice. This one is very red, uh, although not probably not quite as red as uh, autumn fire, which is coming up, uh, but a, a really nice variety. This is autumn carnival right here which is uh, kind of a lavender pink right there. This is Autumn Fire. This one's extremely popular for low growing compact, uh, really super red flowers. But I will tell you that Autumn Sunset's back here and Autumn Sunset's not as quite, you know, not quite as red. It's more of an orangey red. This is a blooming machine. Almost all the time when I see Autumn Sunset, uh, it's in flower. The two that are like that are definitely Autumn Ivory and Autumn Sunset. Uh, here's Sunburst. Sunburst is like that as well. It's actually, generally speaking, I can find flowers on Sunburst. Sunburst has the pink in the middle. It's a, a variegated flower with the white on the edge. There's a new one coming out that is a reverse of that uh, next year. It has the white in the middle. Uh, this one right here, is, this is Autumn Bonfire. This is one of the newest ones uh, in the collection. Gets slightly taller than fire and probably is a little bit redder. But super, super nice plant. This is uh, Autumn Sundance. Has a flower on it. Uh, right here. That's a really nice uh, kind of a medium pink. Um, and then this uh, Autumn Princess kind of has a coral pink 
flower on there. I'm actually, I've never planted that one. I've never had any experience with it, but I really like that. It's a nice flower. I don't know why none of the, none of the retailers I ever see have that one, but that's Autumn Princess. Uh, this is a, this is Autumn Ivory. This is a blooming machine. My, mine just blooms um, for whatever reason in my yard. This thing is just almost constantly uh, seems to be coming back into, uh, into flower. This is Autumn Chiffon. This one's a, another one of the variegated flowering ones that has the uh, white on the edge and the pink um, throat. Really nice plant. Always got really nice foliage too. I always like this one because it's, uh, you know, for, that plant always looks great even when it's not in flower. Uh, Autumn Angel right here. I've got a few of these planted uh, at the house, but this is a really nice uh, vivid uh, white variety. And the last one here is called Autumn Embers. And Embers is, a, is an almost red. It's a, uh, right there, just starting to open up uh, on the bottom. Um, that's a really nice compact variety. And that, that's another one. It always looks great to me, whether it's flowering or not. It's just got a really nice, dense, compact habit to it. So if you live in zone six to 10 and you're looking for a small evergreen shrub that you know, puts on quite a bit of color uh, all the time, these Encore azaleas are definitely a good choice. If you have clay soils, you definitely wanna mound azaleas up a little bit. They don't like uh, wet feet. Other than that, they're very, very easy. Uh, you prune them uh, after they spring flower and you can fertilize them at the exact same time or you could even fertilize a little earlier than that in the late winter if you want to. Uh, and like I say, other than that, super, super easy. There's definitely a color uh, in this collection that would be for everybody. But what I recommend on Encore Azaleas is that you don't plant the same variety throughout your yard. You may, maybe you put three here and three there of several different varieties because as you can see here, some of them are coming into flower, some of them are going out of flower. And I ended up with seven varieties at the, uh, at the old house in Clayton and I almost always had some blooming because of that. This is a dwarf Yopon holly. This is a native holly to the Southeast United States. This is a dwarf version of it. This one, particular variety is called Bordeaux. And you can see the new foliage coming out on that, how it has kind of a wine color. That's the reason this one's called Bordeaux. You'll frequently run into one called Schilling's Dwarf. Uh, it's, it's probably the most common of the uh, named uh, varieties of dwarf yopon hollies. We have a dwarf yopon holly in our neighborhood <laughs> that's six feet tall. It's probably been there 30 to 40 years. That's how long it took to get that high. So keep in mind, again, this group of plants will get taller than that. But then we were down in South Carolina recently and they had made a little knot garden uh, or a little, a little walled garden, basically, like people would think about doing with boxwoods, but with dwarf yopon hollies. And it looked absolutely fantastic and they've maintained them below two feet in height for as long as you want to maintain them at that height. They're not in a big hurry and so it's very easy to keep them that size. So they can just be pruned back into that ball below. Two. So what I would do is I, if you want to keep them around two feet is prune them down to about 18 inches and then let them grow back out of that for a little while so they, you know, so they have a kind of a nice form and then when they reach that, that height again, a slightly above where you want to keep them, cut them a little further than you actually want to keep them so that you can wait a little while and you don't have to constantly be out there pruning them. They just turned on the irrigation behind us, but I wanted to show you this Hetz Midget uh, Arborvita. This is uh, an Eastern Arborvita that can be kept very, very small. Perfect little round ball. We're gonna show you one other conifer in this video that also grows that way. There are several of these named varieties or named cultivars of dwarf arborvita like this that can all be kept small if you get the regular globe arborvita they can get i had one at the old house that ended up four or five feet tall i eventually had to take it out it just the pace of growth meant that any pruning i was doing on it was just you know taken away really really quickly and it started to look awkward so definitely find one of these that has dwarf in the name or something like that and uh, should be very easy to keep these in that two foot range we're doing a video about tough evergreen ornamental plants that can take full sun and stay under, you know, be kept around the two feet in height range. I will say on those Thuja occidentalis, folks in the colder areas can definitely have them out in the full sun. As you get toward southern climate, those uh, eastern arbor, those eastern arborvitas or eastern arbs or eastern thujas, whatever you want to call them, are a little less, a um, little less tolerant of full sun as, you, as the further south you go. So keep that in mind. And this is another one that's kind of the same to me. This is soft touch holly. This is another Japanese holly. I mentioned it when I was talking about the Hellarize over there. 
Uh, lots and lots of these get sold. And this one, you hardly have to do any pruning to it whatsoever to keep it two feet or under. It just kind of grows that way. You can see how compact it is. But in general, I don't think this is a really tough landscape ornamental plant. I see these dying all over the place and I think it really is a water issue. So if you do use soft touch hollies, make sure that you're giving them some ongoing irrigation. Don't, you know, most plants I put in the ground in over a two or three year span, you know, I start to trust more and more and more that they can just kind of be on their own, right? As long as we're keeping them mulched, keeping the weeds away from them, you know, doing our general maintenance, they need less and less from me. This is not a plant that I'm ever going to trust with that situation. So if it becomes abnormally dry at any point, even an established soft touch holly, I'm gonna drag a water hose over to it and give it some additional water. But this is one, I will say, almost no pruning necessary to keep this as two foot tall and three foot wide uh, almost permanently. The last one we're gonna show you for this video is a distillium called Bayou Bliss. This is just a really great distillium. It has blue-green foliage. It stays incredibly compact. These do fantastic in the full sun. We've actually got this one in quite a bit of shade. Uh, and I would thought it would have been stretching and it's not at all. It's still staying super, super compact. It's got a just a low spreading habit. Uh, this one gets, uh, we don't really grow distillium. Distillium's in that same family with the Laura Petalum and the Witch Hazel. And it gets the same kind of frilly flowers, but they're very small on distillium. But this is the most floriferous distillium I have seen. It has lots of red flowers along the stems in the early spring. And it's, in, it's actually very showy. It's one of the first distillium I've seen where I went, wow, that's actually a great flowering plant uh, as well. This is a Brigadoon St. John's wort with it. So this blue-green foliage just looks fantastic against it. This one, again, would prefer a little more sun. I've got to get these shrubs cut off the top of it and to get a little more light on it to make sure it's staying full. But these are just great, great full sun, tough, tough ornamental plants. And you see more and more of them. Nobody knew what a distillium was 20 years ago, and now almost every landscape job I see going in, literally. And, and in the, you know, the city's installations on, on, on parks and that kind of thing, distillium everywhere. In fact, we were in New York City last year and saw them up in Washington Square. Uh, there was a little planting of distillium. I don't know if they survived the winter up there, but it was inter interesting to see how far stillium had, distillium had gone and how fast it's gone there. But there you go. There's 10 plants that you can use in the full sun uh, that will stay, that can be kept somewhere in that two foot range. Again, plants don't read tags. And so I'm sitting here telling you, you can keep these things around that two foot range and they're things that mostly are gonna to try to get wider than tall, but they're gonna go through that. And so you need to know the proper timing uh, to prune them. Most things you prune after they flower, some things you can plant uh, prune in the winter time. I got lots of pruning videos on the channel if you wanna learn more about that. Thank you guys for following along. What's your go-to evergreen low-growing shrub for your area of the country?